live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2017. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Hey, welcome back everyone live here at VMworld 2017 behind us. We got the, the stage here set on the VM Village. A lot of people hanging out. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Vishmal Chan, who's the Senior Director of Product Management at HPE, CUBE alumni, and Eric Ber Bergener, Research Director at IDC. Guys, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, Thanks very you. much, John. Vish, a lot of storage action going on in VMware. You see vSAN, the clouds here, true private cloud report from Wikibon is off the charts, showing a huge growth on-prem cloud operations, storage is impacted. What's the dots that we're connecting here this week? What's the storage story this week? So clearly there's a lot of uh, different things happening in the marketplace, right? Different modes of operation, and that in itself then is demanding different approaches to infrastructure. So I think what you are seeing in the industry a variety of different approaches in storage, right? Whether it's external storage, whether it's software-defined storage, whether it's hyperconvergence, whether it's all flash storage, all of these things are coming together and trying to respond to the needs of data and how you want to process that data. We've been talking with, we've talked to you guys a lot at theCUBE, HP Discover, and we always say software's eating the world. We just heard Sanjay Poonin from VMware talking about it. He likes to drop that sound bite. We, <laughs> we take it one step further, you know. He's a Harvard MBA, but we got the Babs and Mojo here. We say, if software's eating the world, then data's eating software. Okay. So you guys have had a, so a software core competence, and you mentioned data. What is the impact the customers has? More and more data comes in from the edge. There's primary, there's secondary storage, there's backup, there's data protection. It seems to be like this melting pot of changing architectures. How are you guys handling that at HPE? So I think software is a very key element because it provides you with those capabilities, right? To really deal with the logical instantiation of, um, of assets, and, and in this very virtualized world, uh, in this very dynamic world right now, uh, gone are the days where you can do hardware type um, you know, disaggregation, right? Software gives you that speed, that agility, it gives you that flexibility, gives you the change ability to move quickly. Eric, you're at IDC, you guys, this is your job. You guys track the market share, you guys have the pulse. It's like keeping track of the baseball game. What inning, how the Red Sox doing, are they in first place, are the Yankees catching up? You, what is the current state of the server virtualization? Because, you know, certainly the game's changing a little bit. The world's going to cloud. What are you guys seeing in your research? Well, so obviously most mainstream computing is running on virtualization, whether that's in the cloud or that's on-prem. There's very little physical infrastructure left. There is still some of that, but clearly that is not the future. Virtualization is the future. So, I wonder if I may. Uh, so, you say virtualization is the future. So, I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit, because the theme here is cloud. Everything's you know, cloud related. Is it, is it your feeling, Eric, that that's sort of over your skis marketing, getting ahead of where the customer really is. I wonder if you could sort of elaborate. So, you know, I think what the customers are really looking for is an easier way to do their jobs for less cost. And cloud provides flexibility that you don't necessarily get if you're managing your own on-premise infrastructure. That's not 100% true based on some scale issues. But by and large, I think that's really what cloud brings to the table, is a different payment model and a flexibility that you wouldn't necessarily have with on-prem infrastructure. So what are you guys seeing? Do you, do you feel as though the on-prem infrastructure leaders like HP, there are others obviously, are going to be able to bring that cloud-like simplicity to, whether you call it private cloud or, or whatever, on-prem? Is that happening? How fast is it happening? Is it viable? Yeah, so I absolutely think that's happening. In fact, that's one of the reasons why software-defined storage is growing so fast, is those types of products give you the kind of agility that you would normally get from a cloud environment, and if you're running that on-prem and you've implemented the right infrastructure around it, then you're getting many of those same kind of benefits. Now you're paying for that hardware and software in a different manner than you do for the cloud, but you're getting many of those IT agility benefits that you might otherwise get from the cloud. And Dave, you know, um, HP's tagline is making hybrid IT simple, right? And so our point of view is that there is both on-premise and off-premise, um, just depending on what the usage models are and what the problems you're trying to solve, right? And bringing that simplicity where you may be going from 100% on-premise to maybe 20% off, well we've also seen some people at 50% off-premise trying to come back a little bit on premise, right? So both directions I think are very, very key. Is your point of view, and I wonder Eric if you could chime in as well, from HPE's perspective, 
is hybrid IT sort of horses for courses, in other words, workloads on-prem versus workloads you know, off-prem, you know, or is it beyond that, some kind of federation model? So we see three key use cases, right? The first is, of course, wholesale applications running on the cloud. Um, Office 365 is the perfect example of that, SharePoint, Dropbox, right? That's one. Then there is what I would call disaster recovery as a service, where you may want to have your third site in the cloud, even though you've got two sites on premise. Then there's also the third use case around archiving that says, how do I archive a portion of my data maybe into the cloud? So it is online, but you know, I don't have to manage it and I don't have to maybe deal with some of the associated cost around it. So these are the three sort of cases I see. Okay, well, what, are, what are you seeing in the customer base, Eric? Well, so I completely agree that hybrid cloud is the way data centers are going to be built going forward. There are reasons to keep certain workloads on-prem. Generally there's performance, security, or some kind of regulatory requirements that might make you put workloads on-prem versus putting them in the cloud. It also depends on how often you're using the data. So Vish mentioned archive use cases. So that's a case where you need a lot of storage capacity that you keep for a long time, but you may not necessarily be accessing that accessing it that much. If you're going to be accessing data a lot, that's another reason why you might consider bringing it on-prem as opposed to leaving it off-prem. And of course, the access, the costing access models that you get from people like Amazon and Azure are going to impact you know, where you draw the line on that. So is, is there a difference between multi-cloud, I got a bunch of different clouds in my organization, I'm going to choose where to put stuff, and Cross-cloud, sometimes you call it inter-clouding was a, a oh, I like you, that term. Where you can dual, dual source your cloud Yeah, vendor. either, either dual source or federate or actually split application yeah. you know, work. So I think I've seen several different aspects of that, right? So a customer has said to me that they need to move 20% of their data off-premise. To do that, they need two cloud vendors. And to get to two cloud vendors, they need to see four or five of them so they can narrow it down. And then they says, okay, HPE, all of the data that I have today is in your premise or with your equipment. How are you helping us broker that kind of arrangement, mm -hmm. right? And what are you doing to help federate some of that data uh, and work with some of these uh, cloud vendors, right? So I think that's an interesting customer ask. Okay. Well, there's also a cost consideration because if you multi-source or you have the opportunity to multi-source, you've got a competitive environment that's going to drive lower cost for you as opposed to if you've just got one choice. The other issue there is data mobility. If I'm locked into cloud vendor one and it's very difficult, there's major switching costs to move, then that's another reason that might offset you know, the potential price advantage I get from being able to go to any vendor. So you'll see a lot, you know, there's a lot of vendors out there now, infrastructure vendors that are talking about making, uh, making it easier to be able to move data on-prem to off-prem into different clouds from cloud to cloud, and I think that's something that creates a more level play playing field that really is going to ultimately result in lower costs. That's a great point about the cost. I want to just double down a quick question on that. Where are customers tripping over themselves in terms of total cost of ownership? Because what you're getting at there is there's hidden costs right in plain sight. Yeah. What are those trip wires, if you will? What's the pitfalls? What should they be looking well, for? Well, so I, you know, I, I'll give you a general answer to that, but I think that it's very specific to workload type and the regulatory requirements that you're in. But I'll tell you, one of the cases where we see repatriation, workloads moving from the cloud back, back. into on-prem, is when you get to a certain level of scale. And the largest enterprises. Scale in terms of when to bring it back. Well, just or in terms of how, so how much data, how much data do I need to basically maintain in this environment and use on a regular basis. Got it. And the larger scale environments are the one where larger enterprises are able to actually bring back, create their own cloud infrastructure on-prem yep. with their own environments and actually manage that for less cost than what they could otherwise pay a public cloud so provider. So, just to take it one step further to connect the next dot, the CXO, the CIO, has to try to get some stability, and there's some uncontrollable things. Certainly in retail, it's predictable that the holiday season needs bursting or whatever, Absolutely. so you do some things in the cloud, but that's a known pattern. So, you're saying is that they're starting to recognize some of these scale issues for predictability, they bring them on prem. Is that kind of what I'm well, getting? Well, so the, the scale, from a cost point of view. So if you're creating Got your it. own okay. private cloud infrastructure and you're using the same kind of highly agile software-defined storage designs to build that environment, you somewhat have the same ability to burst. 
Now, yeah, you have to buy the hardware and there's redeployment issues and hopefully when we move forward towards much more composable infrastructure, that becomes a lot easier problem to solve, but that's you know, some years in the future. But what I'm really talking about is it, it's the cost. If I'm going to be maintaining a five petabyte data set over a 10 year period, and I know what my access yeah. patterns are, is it cheaper to put that in Amazon or is it cheaper for me to build an infrastructure in house and maintain that That's myself. a great point. Yeah. That's huge, and Vish, what's your reaction to that? Because this basically validates all the action going on on the private cloud right now. Yeah. On-prem activity, they're setting up the cloud models. They can't do that unless you have the operating model. So I'll talk about two things, right? Uh, one called Cloud Bank, another one called Nimble Cloud Volumes and soon to be called HPE Cloud Volumes, right? So Cloud Bank allows you to take um, on-premise data, say running on a three-power array, and actually take a portion of that data onto either an on-premise object store or an off-premise object store, right? And we call that Cloud Bank working together with something called Recovery Manager Central and Store Once, bringing that cloud picture together. Now, the HPE cloud volumes or Nimble cloud volumes, another interesting concept where you have a cloud service, it's block storage service, but it gives you the 6.9's SLA. It gives you the ability to do snapshots and transform data without a lot of charges that you know, Eric talked about. It gives you the ability to move the data to different clouds because it's disaggregated from the major cloud providers, right? It's connected via a close proximity connection. So these are just two examples, I think, that, that show you how we're putting these use cases into action. Hey, we, can we geek out a little bit here? <laughs> Are, oh, aren't we geeking out now? <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, really geeking deeper. out. So, people want, to, want simplicity, we know that, yeah. right? We're talking yeah. about bringing cloud on-prem. How do they get there? You know, one of the ways is VVols, we've sort of been talking about this. They haven't really taken off. Eric, you've written some, some content around this. Like you said off camera, customers don't wake up in the morning and say, I got to get me some VVols. But they do want simplicity. So, Absolutely. Yeah. what are VVols? Why do they matter? And how does it relate to Simplicity. Okay, so yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about that. So, what everybody, no matter whether they're putting storage in the cloud, they're building on-prem, they're building a private cloud, everybody wants to be able to manage their environments more easily, more intuitively. Right. And one of the things that we've seen as a trend over the last five years is in general across the industry, storage management tasks are migrating away from dedicated storage admin teams more towards IT generalists. In many cases, those are the virtual administrators. To enable that kind of a move, you need to make storage much easier to manage. So the whole idea behind VVols is to basically allow a non-storage person who maybe thinks about things in terms of, I'd like to do this operation to an application, for example. I've got Oracle running, or I've got you know, this file system here, and I want to create a snapshot of it, or I want to do some other task on it to be able to just select it at the application level and perform that operation. That's very intuitive, it's easy for a non-storage person to understand, and VVols effectively enables that kind of, a, of an ease of use management in block-based environments. An, an application view of, of, the, of the That's storage. right, and I mean it's effectively, you know, it ties storage operations to a single virtual machine and Basically, you're running an app on a virtual machine, and so that's how you get that tie-in in that way. But one other thing I'll say about VVols is that, so, it's not just what VMware provides, right? There's, there's some work that needs to be done on the storage array side to integrate with that management framework, and then how that vendor has chosen to integrate with that framework is going to determine the functionality that you have access okay. to when you're using that VVOLVES API. And how have you chosen to integrate with that framework? Yeah, so Dave, if you look at VVOLVES, uh, both HPE and, and HPE 3 and Nimble have been very, very strong focus, strongly focused on VVOLVES. In fact, we've been working with VMware, gosh, over the last five years now, uh, on the reference architecture for VVOLVES. Uh, most recently, we've now introduced replication support for both 3PAR and Nimble platforms with VVOLS. And I think that capability now within VVOLS is a very important watershed capability because you know, everybody needs resilience, disaster recovery, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and Automation's so, right around the corner, orchestration, all big topics here at VMworld. Correct, correct. And so that's a very, very key piece, right? And I think if you look at sort of, to Eric's point around simplicity, VVOLS is one key area. Two other areas I maybe I like to highlight as well. Number one is the visibility to what the application sees, and you know, um, within within the Nimble community, they've they've talked about this app data gap, 
right? Which is the applications not knowing why they can't get access to data. And so this notion of bringing that level of understanding, visibility to that gap, saying is it in your compute infrastructure? Is it in storage? Is it in the network? So this notion of VM vision, InfoSight, that Nimble brought on, which we're going to bring on to the rest of the HPE portfolio, I think is very key around simplicity. Then the third thing, let's not forget, is VMware has built a whole ecosystem of management platforms around vCenter, vRealize operations, a lot of orchestration and automation pieces, and so continuing to integrate and offer customers that view is very, very key, right? So, so three-pronged vector, I would say, on, on making things simple. Awesome, and HP Discovers, HP Discovers coming up in Madrid shortly. Yes. Congratulations, good to see you. Eric, thanks so much for stepping by and thanks sharing the much, IDC John. perspective. Thanks very much, John. Eric. <laughs> great job. Live coverage here at VMworld 2017. I'm Jeff Roy, Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with more live coverage after this short break. Thank you. <laughs>